buzzwordy title, but talk to you kind of basically about uh, using serve with SAS and Compass. Um, nowadays, I, I tend not to use uh, a lot of design tools other than like making quick assets. Uh, in terms of like designing a whole page, I tend to just kind of jump right into the browser, uh, right or wrong, better or worse. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about that today. Uh, so I do mobile slash web stuff and UXE things at a company called Project 202. Uh, we have an Austin office and a Dallas office, and we're going to be opening Seattle pretty soon. Um, if you are the type that feels like you have to write everything down, you can just go here and kind of skip your skip having to do that. Um, if you still want to take notes, it's fine by me. Just don't feel like you have to. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll dwell on this for a sec. Um, so it used to be that you know we we would make a design and it would be a PSD or a fireworks PNG or whatever it might might be. And we'd design everything out, right? And we'd show that to the clients to get approval, and everything's static. And if there's a drop down, we'd have a comp for that, the drop down not expanded, and the drop down for the, you know, comp for the drop down expanded. Um, did everybody get this URL? Um, so, truth be told, like, I, I kind of missed those days because it was, it was easy, right? Um, uh, and you could still do that, but I tend to think of um, that as not what we do anymore. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the design equivalent of this code, which, this isn't exactly what I ran to on a client site recently, but it's not very far off. Um, and so I kind of feel like, you know, our, our workflows have kind of evolved since then, right? Um, we're not doing table-based uh, layouts where we're just fighting against specificity to try to get that one TD to be the color we want it to be, right? Um, and so back in the day, or I mean, still, we have these great design tools at our disposal, and Adobe uh, is continuing to kind of evolve and, you know, make better HTML5 tools. Um, but then, you know, this happened, and I think this is the pivotal point at which uh, basically my world fell apart. I don't know about yours. This article came out, and I kind of was like, all right, I had to open in a browser tab for a few days, and I finally read it, and I was like, wait, this is going to change everything. No, I like things the way they are. Uh, and of course, that article and that site now looks like this. And if you constrain the site, the site can do that. And you're like, oh, my gosh, everybody's doing it. Um, so that's the term responsive web design. Uh, that was coined, coined by Ethan Marcotte in his seminal article, um, Responsive Web Design. And uh, basically, it means using fluid, fluid grids and media queries uh, to make things kind of flexy and fit any, any screen, right? Uh, he also wrote a book. Um, so when I heard about this technique, I, at first I felt kind of shock and denial, like, no way, that cannot be done. And then I felt guilty for, like, after having read that, continuing to make, finish up that client site I was working on that was a fixed width, right? And then bargain will like, well, maybe it'll go away. I mean, Flash was a fad. Maybe media queries are not here to stay, you know. And then I kind of felt depressed after it took root and more and more sites were launching over how little I knew about responsive design. And it, then I started looking up, like, well, hey, I could learn CSS. I unlearned table-based layouts. Maybe I can learn this, this flexible stuff. Uh, and then I kind of reconstructed my way of thinking. And finally, I felt hope, like, I think I can actually do this. Um, so yes, those are loosely interpreted, the, uh, the various stages of grief. Um, so I went through denial and bargaining, and, and finally, kind of, we come out the other end of having our, our world turned on its head with responsive design, and realize that this is going to take kind of a new. Um, it's going to require a totally new workflow if that's going to be our final product. Uh, so then the naysayers cropped up. This is actually a guy pushing back against naysayers, but one of the um, critiques which we heard about this morning is, what do we do about images, right? So. Responsive design is bad for performance because you're sending down a desktop image to a mobile phone, and how dare you, you know? Um, but like any technique, you, you can't really blame the technique itself. It's really more in the implementation. Uh, so I kind of think of responsive design like accessibility. It's not an add-on at the end. You know, your client doesn't bring you a site that's totally out of uh, compliance with accessibility and say, you know, say, add, can we tick the checkbox of accessibility, or can you make it responsive, you know? Um, so I'm like, sure, yeah, when's the next full redesign that you're going to gut everything and redo it over and, you know, like, redo everything? Um, I mean, you can add some media queries to kind of hide what's there for desktop, but really you want to be planning from the beginning. And I like this illustration because it's, it's not good if you're trying to use the stairs. It's not really that great if you're trying to use the ramp either. And, I mean, what do you have to use for the handrail on the other side? It's like this spiky fence thing. So, anyways, I just love that picture as an example of tacking on stuff at the end instead of planning from the beginning. So basically, if you're a designer or if you're a developer, having this wall divide of you're going to do the PSDs and you talk to the client, and I don't need to talk to the client or know who the client is, really. And all I know is when I see PSDs put in front of me, they're final. You've agreed upon them with the client. Now I'm going to code them. It's not really the ideal workflow. Um, so I think of it as we need to 
change our vantage point and see our, our role in a kind of continuum of, of the project rather than I'm going to do my siloed work, then I'll hand it, hand it to you, you do your siloed work, and then after me as a front-end developer is done, then I hand it to the server-side developer and he does his siloed work. Um, these are my two kids, so I had to have an excuse to put them in there. Um, so it's not to say that design tools, visual design tools are going away, but we also have new design tools or new code tools that have arisen to help us as front-end developers. Um, one of those being SAS, another being Compass. Um, I would say Compass is to SAS what jQuery is to JavaScript. SAS is pretty cool, and then Compass just like makes it awesome. Um, this is how I like to think of my code organization, almost borderline OCD on the left there, everything nicely separated, even the dots in the bowl are pulled off. And then when we, pull it, when we push it down to the browser, it can be munged together, minified, and concatenated into one file because the browser just cares about like machine code at that point. It doesn't need to be readable to a human. I also like to use this analogy that CSS has a good heart, right? I mean, if you've seen Captain America, he will take on any bad guy, no matter how bad of a beating he will get, and he will not quit. He'll just keep on keeping on, but the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? So I think we've kind of promised ourselves, like, in the next project, it will be better. I will not use the word important at all, and it will be this utopian front end. And then we get into the project, and more than one person's editing it, and it all falls, falls apart, right? Because hell is other people's code. Um, so I think of SAS as kind of giving it a little bit more oomph. You have, uh, you have iterators, you can do loops, you can do comparison, like if-then logic, uh, and you have variables, and you have mix-ins, where you can have style chunks that are injected into other contexts. And then Compass gives you some awesome stuff to handle CSS3. Like, I never want to write another browser uh, vendor prefix again. I just, I write Compass and it takes care of all that for me. Um, so I don't mind memorizing things on the left, whereas like the stuff on the right, I would not put on any human being to ever have to know. You'd want to automate that somehow, be that uh, with a preprocessor or some IDE. Because really, I mean, eventually it's all going to be uh, this stuff on the bottom, right? All those vendor prefixes are going to go away when this one great day, all the browsers agree at the same time, and just overnight we get the memo, like, it's, it's perfect. You can use it now, you know? Border bottom left radius is 4px, and you don't have to have dash khtml or any of that other stuff. Um, also, this is pretty cool, too. You can turn on experimental support for SVG, which I always turn it on. I don't know, I feel, feel kind of like a scientist because I'm turning on this experimental thing. Um, and I write one line of code, background linear gradient from white to light gray and it creates all this stuff. And that giant blob, like this huge string, that's a base64 encoded SVG file that goes from white to CCC, and it's infinitely scalable horizontally and vertically. And that's for IE9, because it can do base64 backgrounds, but it can't do CSS gradients. So that's kind of cool. If you're kind of on the fence about trying SAS or Compass, uh, this is just an overwhelming list of IDEs to say that don't let that be an excuse. Um, so about two years ago, I joined HP, and we were a Ruby on Rails team. Um, at the time, I was told, we're going to prototype and serve. And I'm like, sounds good. And I, and I ended up liking it, which is good. Um, so for the past two years or so, at various jobs um, and on various projects, I've been enjoying using serve. So that's just get-serve.com. And I like to joke with John Long, who made serve, like, that's not exactly the most Googleable open source project name. So I, I like to leave the URL up there because if you just Google for serve, you'll get the phone book, right? Um, so this is the site. Basically, it lets you use um, ERB, if you're familiar with that templating from Rails, or Haml. Haml is kind of like HTML with no closing tags. It's white space sensitive, so it just kind of adds all your closing tags as it parses. Um, so it's really cool because it's all indentation based, and it, it makes it so you never have to play the what div closing tag, you know, what, what starting tag does this closing div tag close? Um, and of course, you can do uh, SAS and Compass, and um, there's also some ways to get CoffeeScript working in there. Uh, today, I'm just going to talk about SAS and Compass, though. Uh, so I kind of think of serve as like, like if, if Compass is Captain America, serve like brings so much more to the table. Um, and since I can't show you any client stuff I've worked on using serve, I'm going to talk about a site I made today called Unsemantic. Um, how many here have used like, or heard of the 960 grid system and love or hate it? Everybody can put their hand up, or if, you're, if you don't care, then keep your hand down, I guess. Um, so yeah, a lot of people would call that unsemantic, and I kind of think of class names as being devoid of semantics unless you're using microformats. So I decided to thumb my nose at that whole back and forth naysaying and just call my new grid framework unsemantic.com. So here's that at the, uh, you know, it's the homepage on desktop. 
little brief definition, adjective, unsemantic is a non-existent word that developers use to tear down work of their peers. Now, it's also a noun, CSS framework. I mean, if the shoe fits, let's wear it, right? Um, here's the same uh, site, but at a mobile width. And so I think of kind of what I do is in terms of wireframing and prototyping kind of like this, um, which is basically that everything that I do and everything that a designer does and everything that an IA does, if you're a designer, your final deliverable is not a PSD and then you're done. And if you're an IA, your, your final deliverable should not be in your mind a PDF and you're done. In me as a front-end developer, I shouldn't say, well, it works as flat HTML. It's up to the server-side guy to figure that out, right? Uh, like we talked about before, it needs to be a vantage point of I'm seeing this through to completion. Unless that thing launches, then I have failed. Um, or I like to say that uh, everything else kind of burns away in the atmosphere. You know, all our documentation, all our business uh, requirements gathering, all that is kind of what hits the atmosphere and dies, and the final project goes on and, you know, lives on and soars to greater heights. Uh, so to that end, serve is basically the V, the view uh, layer of Rails MVC. When I say view, really I'm just talking about HTML. Um, and if you've ever done like a PHP include, you've done basically what serve is doing, except in Ruby. So there's nothing like magic about it. Uh, so this is an index.html.erb uh, file. It's basically what's served on the home page that's unique to the home page. Um, there's a sibling file called layout that points to the application. Uh, if you've done .NET, this is basically like a, um, a master page, is the layout, layout concept. Um, then yield is what spits out the actual view into the file. And we, al we also have a, par in a partial and a separate file uh, the head of the document, which includes style sheets. And there's all sorts of craziness going on there, and this is in no way how you should build a real website, because I've got like... If some variables are set, then I'm going to go right to left language, and if it's not set, then I'm going to assume left to right. And if you set um, adapt.js to true, that means you're not using media queries, you're swapping in and out live CSS, or you're swapping out CSS files live with JavaScript. Um, so anyways, because I built this site to facilitate showing off a grid framework, I felt like I needed to have the site itself show off every permutation. Um, and then there's some cool stuff you can do in serve, which this is also a convention in Rails called the content for block. So anywhere in any other page or any other partial, I can type content for style sheets do, and then make sure I type end at the end. And between there, I can just freely type CSS. And if that exists, it'll get injected down here into a style tag. And I also have the same thing set up uh, for JavaScript. So that actually appears up in the head of the document. And if I type JavaScript within a content for, that will appear all the way at the bottom of the document after every other script tag has loaded. So let's look at uh, SAS variables. I like to keep all my variables in a separate file called vars. You can name it kind of whatever. The naming doesn't really matter. Um, so that is consumed by uh, the base grid file. It's like, all right, cool, I'm following with you. Uh, so that, that uh, can extend what are called placeholders. So this is, could basically be thought of as a class name that never emits its styles unless it's also used with extend. So it's, a, it's like a silent chunk of code ready to be used in a style sheet. But if you don't use it, your style sheet doesn't increase in size or anything. So that's imported by the responsive partial. Uh, yeah, another import, right? So you might be thinking, what? This guy does not know what he's doing. And I'm not even trying to say I do. I'm just saying this is where the imports go. Uh, so that gets imported on, into the context, into the scope of a media query. So I've got the grid base that is common across mobile and desktop. I've got a uh, mobile, uh, mobile partial that's pulled into the context of my media query breakpoint, which is 767 pixels. That's one pixel less than the iPad. So if you're on anything smaller than that, you'll get mobile. And anything iPad and up, it gets like desktop slash tablet -y layout. And then the last one brings in you know, beyond uh, 767 pixels and up. So that's like, what is going on? So then that is actually consumed by the code that you would write uh, if you have like application.sas file or styles.sas file. Um, then we have one more here just for like some little tweaks I'm doing to the navigation. Um, you might be wondering like why is, what is the point of separating everything out so much? Like you just love imports. And you also might be wondering like, oh, so here's, a, here's how you can compress things. Um, you also might be wondering, like, with that many at imports, how many like, subsequent chaining, daisy chain of HTTP requests is that, right? Like, we all know that at importing too much stuff is bad. Um, 
The cool thing about SAS is when you import something into a file, it just becomes one file. So at this point, we're, we're just keeping things uh, separated so that we can scope them. So we've got things like this here. Um, the benefit of that is then it all becomes one file, uh, and it can be minified, and it's concatenated, and you know, just basically machine code for the browser. Um, so yeah, we covered that. Uh, so the astute observers might have noticed as I was flipping through the slides, like, that's a heck of a lot of flat CSS files. Like, am I, are you using all of those on the site? And the answer is no. Um, I'm, I'm pulling those into separate files so that when you click on links from the site, you can see just the grid code by itself and not have to see, like, the header and footer of the, the site that's displaying the framework, because that's irrelevant to what you're going to try to do with it. Um, those, are the, those are the flat files that live out in the repo on GitHub. And this is why I separate things out, because then I can pass a variable that says lang forward and lang reverse, and then I just import the exact same partial, and I have everywhere that the word right or left would appear is variableized. So if you're um, making a site to be read in Hebrew or Arabic from right to left, you just set these two variables, import and everything else floats right, everything's, you know, push and pull classes are all reversed. Um, and also for older IE, for IE 8 and below that don't understand media queries, I reassemble the same site as I did in application, which is for good browsers, except I don't have any media queries and I'm not bringing in the mobile grid, so instead I bring in the base of my grid and my desktop grid and that's it, and that gives IE 7 and IE 8 a fixed width layout. And you might be wondering, wait, you're treating IE differently, you can't not give it a fluid, like or you can't not give it a, a responsive layout that goes down to mobile, except when we think about it, IE7 can't be used on, on mobile or isn't, you know, browser share-wise. Um, so I don't see anything wrong with serving a desktop-looking site to a desktop-oriented browser. So hat tip to Nicholas Gallagher for the idea. Uh, he had this great uh, blog post that basically described exactly what I just showed you. Um, and he works at Twitter now, and he said the other day, are you new to front-end web development? Uh, here's a secret, nobody knows what they're doing either. And I would include myself in that, uh, in that category. So uh, maybe I don't know what I'm doing, uh, but here's an idea anyways. Uh, here's a little, this is a Ruby function in my view helpers file. Uh, if flat HTML is set to true, then I emit this string of .html. And if it's not, then I give an empty string. And then I set it in this partial called vars, where I've just got this one variable that's either true or false. And in here, in my actual view files, I have this little function that says HTML. Okay, you probably think I'm crazy. I wouldn't argue. Um, so further evidence, I probably don't know what I'm doing. I have a command line uh, set up, like a shortcut. This can be in a bash file or a Z shell. Uh, basically, I don't want to type CD and serve every time I want to just serve the site locally. And then when I want to export to flat HTML, I don't want to have to remember all this. So I type just unsemantic site HTML. And I'll set this up for like various client projects. So it could be like client underscore site underscore HTML to show them templated uh, flat HTML. That runs through this crazy list and shows me all the files that it made. And then it makes this folder that I'm putting out on the web and it makes me a templates.zip file so I can, if the client is like, well, I don't, I don't want to preview in the browser. What if I'm offline? I want to look at it. Like for some reason, some people love to have that like on their hard drive. And that's kind of why I have that, uh, that function so that we can serve it with clean URLs from the internet or have .html extensions for uh, if they want to browse it just on their local machine. And they don't have to like, have an Apache instance running or anything. Uh, so I'm going to demo real quick, if that's OK with you guys. Um, first off, any questions, like any, any stuff that I cover that you want, want to see in the demo? I know the code was kind of small, but I can zoom in. Um, all right, then I'm just going to demo what I want to demo. Um, so I've got the project file here. And you can kind of see like where I'm going with the, like got, here's my view. Here's the uh, layouts application. Here's the partials. Like I have like different style sheets partials that pull in different stuff. Um, here's the head, footer. So I'm going to go in here and find my on semantic.com folder. I'm just going to delete that. And then I'm going to show you how that works when I run it here. Um, actually, let's run, let's run serve locally real quick. I'm going to set this down to type. So 
The serve always runs off of port 4000, which is kind of cool because it won't conflict with Rails, which runs on port 3000. Um, so you can see here, like, I've got the links, and um, it's actually pointing to demo dash responsive with no extension. Uh, but again, if I come here in my vars file and I comment out false, and I make that true, and I hit save, and I come back over here and run my crazy magic, then this will output and create that unsemantic folder that I just deleted. Uh, open Chrome. Um, so now if I go here, you'll notice that that's actually a .html extension. So then I can email the client and say, hey, look, here's uh, this template file that you wanted me to send you. And then they can open that and, you know, they can browse around the actual thing that we're building for them. So it's kind of cool. Um, so that's kind of it for me. I know I breezed through. Uh, any, any particular questions or, yep? Uh, I do it so that when we want to preview things out on the web and, or if like I'm giving something to a developer and their route is going to exactly match my clean URL, um, then they don't have to worry about, okay, well, Nathan made all these end in .html and I have to do it like a find replace, you know. Um, oh, gotcha. Okay, because serve is just the V. Like, you'd probably have, like, an environment variable if you were doing, like, a real Rails app. This is me faking it up. Um, so, yeah. Um, anything, any other questions? Yep. Um... I like to hit up Chris Epstein on IM, but I'm not sure that scales for him. Uh, I guess just, I mean, there's a community mailing list that I'm on. Um, I'll chime in every now and then, but mostly I just read and like, I'm just kind of a lurker and I learn passively by seeing other people's questions uh, asked and answered. Um, I mean, the, the documentation site is pretty good, but it also doesn't help if you don't know what to search for, right? So it's like not knowing the spelling of a word and trying to use, an, use a dictionary, right? So. Yeah. Um, so this, I don't know if this is helpful, but like I, I have completely documented like um, how to consume like all the different, uh, I, that's, that should be indented there, um, how to consume all the different placeholders and stuff. So that, that will at least like help um, with the concept of like silent uh, placeholders. Some, some people call them silent classes because it's like using extend in the class name in SAS. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I've just kind of, join mailing lists and, you know, that type of stuff. Uh, yep. Oh, no, no, like I can, let me come back here. Uh, so here's serve running locally. Um, and that's like live. I can make a change and see that. I only run that build step when I'm ready and I want to export to flat HTML. Um, so like if you go to unsemantic.com, um, Uh, so like this is all out there. It's just flat HTML, but like, I don't know if you've seen that old Begin Strips commercial where dogs don't know it's not bacon. Like, users don't have to know it's not URL mod rewrite or anything. You know, it's just straight up. Uh, oh, and this is what this is what um, serve ships with options multi views will make Apache be like, eh, you supplied a URL. It's, that's close enough for me. <laughs> you don't need the you don't need the dot HTML in the end. I'll go find you a file that looks like that. Um, so that's what allows you to have clean URLs when you deploy in the. Uh, the surf site itself um, runs on uh, uh, just like flat HTML. Serve.com. It's like if I go to get started, I could just as easily add like dot HTML. Um, so like if you're doing, uh, let's say you're doing like WordPress or Drupal site or whatever, I probably wouldn't use Serve for that just because it's already got its own templating system, but this is great for me if I'm on a Rails project um, and it's in flux, like on the server side. I don't have to pester a Rails developer to be like, hey, can you set me up a controller with these views because I want to just do flat HTML. Um, and the nice thing is, like, for the most part, unless they totally disagree with, like, my logic, like, my code not, might not be the rest, best. I don't consider myself, like, a, a Rubyist or whatever, but, uh, um, like, 
they might have a more elegant way of doing that, but like they can see my thought process of if the page is responsive left to right, then add the class of on, you know, that, like that type of stuff. And I found that even working with .NET developers, um, they like to see the, the raw serve code or the, you know, the ERB, because they can see, okay, well, I'll split out my .NET partials that way, you know. Um, so it's just a little bit more, I guess, sophisticated way of doing flat HTML. Uh, but you could probably get the same with like PHP includes, uh, uh, that type of thing. I just like that it, it mirrors the views of Rails and I can just say, here we go, look, I'm a, you know, I'm not a Rails developer, but I play one on the internet or whatever, so, yep. Any other questions? Cool, well, the, I'll put the uh, slides back up to where you can download the deck. Um, I also made a Git repo of the serve dot, or the, um, the unsemantic.com site, so if you want to go and pull that down and run it locally as a serve project, you can just kind of see how I did some of that. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming.